like I said, we're entering into a new section here in the book of Isaiah. If you guys remember what was happening in the book of Isaiah, we saw Isaiah give a message of judgment. And I love that he doesn't just say judgment. Do you guys notice that about God? He doesn't just say, hey, by the way, I'm going to bring down fire and brimstone upon you because you deserve it. You're being rebellious. You're not listening. No, no. In fact, what God does is he kind of, he mixes it with hope. He says, yeah, you're messed up. You're rebellious, but there's hope. There's hope in me. There's hope for Jerusalem is what Isaiah was saying as he was bringing accusation of accusations against uh, Jerusalem's leader. He was bringing accusations of rebellion, of idolatry, of injustice, of covetousness. They were stealing from the poor. They were pretty rotten people. God said that he was going to judge the city by bringing the surrounding nations to conquer Israel. Specifically first Assyria, and then whatever was left of Judah later on down the road by Babylon. God said that it would be like a purifying fire. And again, notice, God wasn't just going to judge the people just to show them who was boss. But he was going to bring judgment like Hebrews says that God chastises those he loves. You ever been there? <laughs> you ever been in those moments where you know you're being rebellious and God starts bringing that, uh, I should say, loving hand of judgment upon you? Listen, Christian. He does that because he cares. Like a loving father, he doesn't want you to enter into rebellion. He doesn't want to, you to go down that road further. And so like a purifying fire, he said he would bring that upon Jerusalem, that it would burn away all of their worthlessness. And then Isaiah, towards the end of those 12 chapters, started looking towards the future. That millennial kingdom, the Bible teaches, the thousand year reign of Christ where he would create a new Jerusalem and bring not just the Jewish people, but all the nations of the world to come worship him. All of those who would choose to worship him, he would bring them together. He would make everything right. Now that time isn't now, obviously, but he says that time is coming in the future. God is giving mankind a chance to change, to change their hearts, to change their attitudes, and to come to Him. The Bible teaches that people would come from all around the world to worship God during this millennial kingdom. Isaiah saw God on His throne, filled with glory, filled with His holiness. And that's when Isaiah realized how unholy he actually was. Seeing God in his majesty. The Bible says, as the train of his robe filled the temple, Isaiah was like, woe is me. I am, I am a nasty man. I am, I am gross. And, that, and that's kind of what happens when you're in the midst of God. This is kind of what we need to do. It, I know it doesn't make us feel good. I know this isn't popular in the church. What the church is, is, is pushing is all about how to make you feel good. Listen, guys. When you're in the presence of God, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify it for you. This is how it's supposed to work. When you're in the presence of God, as we're studying his word, as we're worshiping him, there is a sense of realizing how nasty we are. Because when the light of God is shining upon all with no shadows, every little nasty thing comes brought into the light. You know what happens when you turn on the light? All the little cockroaches scatter. Yeah, you see everything that was hiding there, right? And, and this is what happens, but, but it's not just to leave you there. It's not just to leave you downcast. Listen, it's to give you hope because as that light hits you, you're able to deal with all of that nasty stuff. I know we want to hide it. We can't do that anymore. We got to bring those nasty things up and we got to bring them to God. And that's what happened with Isaiah. He was like, woe is me. And then remember what God did? Bible students, he took, the, he took the coal, right? The angel, and I love this because the angel didn't even touch the coal. He got a, a, some thongs to pick it up and you're like, whoa, if this angel can't even touch this, like I don't want to be touched by that thing. And, but the angel picks up some thongs, gets the coal and, and purifies Isaiah's lips. And here, here's the catcher, man. This is what God does. He says, you're gross, 
you're nasty, this, this is what you kind of realize, but I'm going to purify you by what? By some cold? No, what was that picture of, guys? The altar. The altar, specifically? Sacrifice. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Calvary. The cross. God says, now that I have cleansed you, go and do my work. No more can we sit back and say, I am unworthy, God. I can't do this. I am unclean. Yeah, that's why you came to Jesus. But now that God has cleansed you, now God asks you to move forward. And he's asked Isaiah, now that you have been cleansed, you are to go and do the work I have before you. You are to pronounce judgment to the people. But it kind of had a paradoxical effect on the people, didn't it? As Isaiah was pronouncing judgment upon the people, the people unfortunately didn't listen. But their hearts became hard. This is what happens when you hear Bible studies without an intent to apply it to your life. Do you guys hear what I just said? Is anybody listening by chance? I just need a, one person. Great. That's right. One person. I'll take it. Sharon, this is for you. Listen, when you come to Bible study without an intent to to listen and apply and do what it says when you hear the word of God. Did you know it's actually bad for you? It's actually very dangerous for you. We said this in youth group. Me and Rob both said it many times. We told the kids. We told the kids. I was like, if you're, I know your parents make you come here. We were talking to the kids. But if you're not serious about following God, don't come. Stop coming. I was like, yeah, you, you'd be like flabbergasted to hear a pastor say that, right? To hear a Bible teacher say that. But that's right. If you're not serious about God and about this book, whatever, maybe you're here for the cute girl, the cute guy, whatever, stop. Do not come back. Because the Word of God has the ability that if not applied, will harden your heart against God against what he's trying to say. And you see that happening in Israel. Unfortunately, even though Isaiah was prophesying the word of God to the people, the people did not heed it. Instead of the people turning to God, they turned to their rebellion. They turned against God. And so, what did Isaiah say was going to happen? By the authority of God, he said, so Israel was going to be like a tree. Israel was going to be like a forest, the forest of Lebanon, which was a huge, beautiful forest, thick trees. He said it's going to be cut down. Remember the picture? He said there's, no, there's going to be nothing but stumps. I'm going to cut you down, Israel. I'm going to chop you down. I'm going to leave nothing but stumps. And then <laughs> and in the midst of this sadness, God says, but don't worry. Even though you're rebellious, from one of those stumps, I'm going to bring a little shoot. I'm going to bring like a little leaf. You can kind of see it like a, like a little cartoon, right? Like a little picture, like a little illustration. There's like this stump, and out of it, it just, the rain starts falling on it, and a little, a little green sprout kind of pokes out of the stump, right? And he says, do you see that? This is going to be the root from Jesse. Remember that promise, Israel? That promise that I would bring the Messiah through you? Yes, even though you're rebellion. And I just love God's word. It actually gets really exciting. Even though you're rebellious, I am still going to keep my promise to you because I am faithful. Remember what the Bible says? Even though you remain faithless, God remains faithful. I will bring my promise through you and I will bring the Messiah through you even though you're rebellious. And he will come and bring salvation to the world. And we know that's what happened. This is why you read those genealogies in the book of Matthew, in the book of Luke. Why? Because they tell you, look at this genealogy. It goes all the way back to David. Look at this. It's exactly like I said I would happen. And so God says, and he's saying to us today, that even though you're rebellious, I will still work through you. He's looking at Israel. This shoot is going to come out. And so we ended Isaiah chapter 12 with kind of a message of hope. 
But, uh, but let me ask a question. When did all of this happen? When did Israel actually get kind of uh, destroyed? Because Isaiah saw another empire rising after Assyria. Because remember, who's the top dog at this time? In, this, in Isaiah's time, who's the top dog? Assyrians, right? They are the top dogs. Babylon, who would actually attack Jerusalem, Isaiah tells us, and destroy it, was like a little guy at this time. So it was kind of funny when you hear about it. Oh, just so you know, here's Isaiah proclaiming a message, a message of judgment. Just so you know, the Babylonians are going to come destroy you, Jerusalem. And you can see the, the people in Jerusalem like, huh, the Babylonians? It's kind of like telling America, in the modern day, it'd be like a prophet coming to America and saying, oh, just so you know, the Canadians are going to come attack you. And you're like, the Canadians? Mexico's going to come attack you. Mexico? We're America, man. We don't have to worry about that. And Because and at this time, Babylon was kind of being supported by Assyria. And so this brings us to Isaiah chapters 13 through 23. Chapters 13 through 23, the next section of the book, which is going to be a series of judgments surrounding Israel. A series of judgments. It's kind of like God's going to move away from Israel for a time and now proclaim judgment to the surrounding nations. Look at Israel. Israel has never been in a safe position. Israel has always been attacked. I, uh, did any of you guys actually download the Red Alert app? Remember Jack was talking about it? Did any of you guys actually download it? I downloaded it because of the same reason. I wanted, the Bible says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And even like once a week, it's amazing. Like once, if not once a week, once every couple weeks, rockets attacks on Israel. Yeah, they have their, their, their dome. They're able to shoot down most of these rockets. But still, that's scary to be walking around your city and then having a rocket attack. It actually happened today again. Two rockets attacks. Noon today, which I don't know. I think it was maybe 11 p.m. there. But Israel's like constantly under attack. It's like, what is happening? There's a hatred for Israel. But this was definitely true of the Old Testament times. The Old Testament nations wanted to get rid of Jerusalem. And so God was going to pronounce judgment on them. And in this chapter, chapter 13 and 14, we're going to focus on one specific city of judgment. And that is Babylon. If you're taking notes, this is what we're going to talk about. Babylon. 13 and 14 all about Babylon and how, what God was going to do with them. Because God is going to make some very specific prophecies concerning this, this empire. And how it would fall and how it would happen. Guys, this is the God we worship. There's really no, I know we all do it. Maybe you're different. I'm, let me just put myself there, okay? Let me just put myself as the example of what not to do kind of person. I doubt God, and it's so annoying. God tells me to do something. Hey, go share with that person. Well, that person's scary. He has tattoos, right? He's big. I don't know what he's going to... And sometimes they're not. It's like some skinny guy. You know what I mean? Like, like he, he looks wimpy. He looks totally disarming. I'm like, no, God. What if, what if he has a knife? Right? You know what I'm saying? And listen, we serve the God of the future. How did Jack say it, Gabe? He who holds the future. He, I love how Jack says it. He who holds the future. That's the God that we serve. The God that controls time and space. The God that, listen, America is not going to be done until God is done with America. God is in control of the nations and the worlds and the empires and the kings around us. He is in control of the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. There's really nothing to be worried about. And we know that prophecy is one of the biggest trademarks of God. 
why, look, there's many reasons why you should trust your God. But put on top of that list, spoken and fulfilled prophecy. Spoken and fulfilled prophecy. They prove who God is. And even when God goes into a match, when he matched himself against the idols, the false gods, remember what he did? He always came back to prophecy. He's like, look at your little statue gods. They can't blink. They can't walk. They can't do this. We're going to see later on in Isaiah. I can tell you the future. And I'm going to do that. I'm not just going to say, hey, follow me blindly. Cover your eyes. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. This is usually the final card God would always pull out was prophetic revelation to prove his power over your life. And so the city of Babylon. Let me talk about this city a little bit. This crazy city. This is what God is talking about. This city, again, if you're taking notes, was perhaps one of the greatest cities in ancient times at that time. One of the greatest cities at that time. It was surrounded by a 30-foot moat, the sides of one wall. Check this out. The sides of one wall across the city were 14 miles long. Can you guys, are you guys picturing this 14 miles long? They were, and not only that, they were double walls. So you had one wall, another wall happening here. 311 feet high. Wow. Which means you could put 11 parked cars on top of this wall. It was said that you could take eight chariots and you could run them across each other on this wall. In fact... Historians tell us that they actually did races on top of the wall with chariots. Three to six chariots at a time. They would race across the wall. This is a big city. Not only that, the Bible says, or I should say history says, that there were 250 watchtowers all along the wall. Each watchtower extending 150 feet above the wall. So you got the 300 was it 15? And then you got this 200, um, 150. This was like 450-ish feet high above this wall with men, with armor and bows, arrows watching for enemy attacks. This was a huge city. This was a powerful city that God is now pronouncing against. This is big stuff, guys. It was a powerful city, and in this chapter, God is going to pronounce its destruction. God is going to pronounce its doom. It was the center of trade. It was the center of culture. It was the center of learning only rivaled against Egypt at that time. Top of the line city. How is my mind? Where's your mind at right now? You don't know what my mind's thinking? America. Literally the leader of the world right now. The leader of the free world. See? You see why God puts this stuff here? To let us know that he is in control. In fact, you could even say, maybe you could even say back, if back in their time, they were probably in a better position of safety than we are now. You could say that. I don't, I, you know, I don't actually know, but it seems like a crazy city, right? Now we have nukes. Like everybody gets just nukes trying to, what do we do then? I don't know. Right? <laughs> but at the time that this chapter, chapters 13 and 14 were written, remember, put this in your head. The dominant power wasn't Babylon. Again, the Bible predicts that they're going to become this mighty empire. But when Isaiah was writing this, guys, you know, they weren't the top dog. The dominating power was Assyria. In fact, Babylon was actually dependent uh, upon this, uh, a dependent state upon Assyria. Yet Isaiah not only predicts the fall of that nation, but its rise to power. Wow. That is some awesome stuff. Again, I, I, I really hope this stuff doesn't bore you because this is the stuff that it should actually get us excited. We need to realize that our God is in control. This is the stuff that we have to learn about. I know, I know a lot of us don't like history class, but we need to know this. Why? Because when that time of difficulty comes, 
You need to know, oh wait, that's right. God literally had power over a huge empire. I'm pretty sure he can handle my life. <laughs> so again, when this was written, people would look and they were confused. They were like, Isaiah, you're, you're on some stuff, man. You're, I don't think you're hearing from God. And this is... And then, what does the Bible say? Ezekiel 38 and 39. I get excited about this. You guys know what the Bible says is going to happen? I don't know if it's pre-rapture or after the rapture. That I'm not confused about. But Ezekiel 38 and 39 has a prophecy that, check this out, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And some of those other countries, not Saudi Arabia, not the Gulf states. Do you know the other ones? The little guys? But, but anyways, it, but those three major guys, let me just focus on the major guys because I remember this, are going to attack Israel during the last times. And they're going to come from the north. Now, if you know anything about like a map, if you have a map in your head, this is what, you're, this is what you should be thinking. You should be thinking, no, there is no way Russia can come down from the north without Israel and the rest of the world knowing about it. There is no way that this could happen. Iran? No, nah, they're not going to work with Turkey. In fact, they were actually fighting not so long ago. What happened, students? What happened as of recent? ISIS. The rise of ISIS in Syria. You guys remember what happened? And Russia, Putin, were, this is what they basically said. They said, we want to go into Syria, which is just on the northern part of Israel. And we want to go in and we want to take care of ISIS. They started working together with Iran. They actually had an alliance with Turkey. Just like the Bible says was going to happen. This wasn't true in most of the world's history. But yet it's happening and it's in effect right now in 2019. They came in through Assyria. And remember, America pulled out most of its troop under Obama, right? And who's because America probably would have stood up for Israel, but they're gone. And who came in? Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Now I'm not saying this is gonna happen, but you guys need to know the Bible says that in the latter times, those nations would work together and like a hook. In Ezekiel, that's what he says, like a hook, we're going to be dragged down to attack Israel. Isn't it amazing? They're right there on the northern border. They have bases set up there now. Syria is basically gone. It doesn't really, the government doesn't really exist. ISIS is, you know, they have little, maybe sleeper cells, but for the most part, they're gone, Right? In Russia, Iran, and Turkey are in the northern part of Israel. Now, they, they're like, we're not going to attack Israel. We're cool. But the Bible says that there's going to be a hook that's going to draw that nation down. How about when the Bible predicted <laughs> that there would be a second temple rebuilt? How about when the Bible predicted that the nation would be reborn? Let's go to 1948, right? Remember that important year? I always talk about it. What, what did it say? It said that this would happen. And for most of history, the church was all like, when Israel didn't exist, was like, oh, that's not going to happen. There's no way God could do that. There's no way God could bring a nation back together again. And so what did the church start doing? They started teaching something called church replacement, replacement theology, right? Replace where? Oh, this is what, it, it's funny how Christians will do this. They, they try to protect the word of God because they're afraid God can't protect his own word and his own prophecies to his people. So this is what they said when Israel didn't exist. Oh, we're spiritual Israel now. That's how God's going to keep that promise. <laughs> That's what they said. And then 1948 happened and they're like, maybe we should have just trusted God. <laughs> Again, we, we don't think about that now in 2019. Most of us don't. That's not even a thing in our mind, but we forget how Christians back then doubted. There were, there were some who stayed on it, and they were mocked because of it. And then the last one I wrote down here was, how about this? How about the book of Revelation, where the Bible predicts that two prophets are going to come back, and the whole world is going to see them be killed? How, how's, 
Isaiah, John writing that? Let's go to New Testament times, Roman Empire. How, the, how could the whole world see two guys in Jerusalem be killed? Oh, wait. You see what's happening? You see that? FaceTime, right there. What, can you imagine the, the Twitter notifications, the Instagram? Somebody started a live video, Fox News, CNN. Can you imagine this? Just blowing up all over your phones. Can you imagine? First of all, you got these two guys breathing fire, right? You got these guys calling down judgments, pronouncing the word of God. You think the media is not going to be all over that? I'm sure, they'll cut the word of God part out. I'm sure they'll figure out how to do that. But everybody's going to have a smartphone. In fact, I, I heard a little, there was like a little kind of advertisement. You can have pen, pen cameras. You can have GoPros. In John's day, unthinkable. How about in 2019? Guys, don't be fooled. Don't look, the Bible said this stuff is gonna happen. John had no idea. But yet your word, this book in front of you said it was going to happen. It makes sense now. We should get ready. We'll even look at verse 17 of Isaiah chapter 13. Look at that real quick. The only verse I'm gonna to go to in Isaiah 13 tonight. We're gonna to go somewhere else. But look at verse 17. It says, Behold, I will stir up the meat. Oh, this gets so yeah. good. <laughs> I will stir up the meat against them. Who? Against Babylon. Who will not regard silver, and as for gold, they will not delight in it. I love it. Because what, what, what is God saying? Not only is this nation, that's, this empire, that's not a big deal. Babylon going to rise and then going to be conquered. It's going to be conquered by these other guys known as the Medes and later on it's even less of a big deal than Babylon. You guys see what's happening here? The, the people are looking at this and they're like, nah, man, this is crazy stuff. Those little guys, those little guys. And it's, I don't, I don't know what's smaller than Canada. Venezuela. Venezuela is going to come and take out Canada. <laughs> After Canada takes out America, Venezuela is going to take out Canada. And you're like, what? That doesn't, what? That's literally what's going on here. And you know, it's just to get you a perspective of what's going on. Way in advance before the Medes was any significant sort of people group is the prediction of the breaking down of their power structure, the Babylonian power structure by the Medes and the Persians. And I'm going to end with this. Look, not, I'm not going to end. But turn to Daniel chapter 2. I don't want you guys to get too excited there. But Daniel chapter 2. Oh boy. Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 31. You guys all know this story, right? Everybody know this story? Did you turn there? Turn there. No, I don't want that. Turn there. The Bible's on the table. 2.31, 2.31. Um, you, O king, you got, let me just skip the back story, just because I love the story so much. What's going on? King Nebuchadnezzar, he is now in charge. Again, this is, Isaiah is dead at this point. Everything that happened here in Daniel was prophesied by Isaiah, but while this is happening in Daniel, Isaiah is already dead. It's already been prophesied about. And so the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he wakes up from this dream, and he has this crazy dream. It freaks him out. Most powerful king in the world, he's freaked out by this dream. He says, find me somebody who can interpret the dream. Do you remember the story? Find me somebody who can interpret the dream. Oh, and by the way, tell them that they have to tell me the dream and interpret it. I don't want any of the charlatans. Remember what? I'm going to call him Mr. Nezer from Veggie Tales. Remember what Mr. Nezer said? He was like, he's like, the, the, the wise men were like, nobody can do that, king. He's like, all right, well, I'm going to kill all of you. And they're like, what? And he starts killing them. And then, and then finally Daniel, Daniel has, he's like, I can give you the interpretation from God. God will give me the interpretation. The God of Israel, I love Daniel. Boldness. And he's like, I'll give you the interpretation. He prays. He seeks God. God gives him the revelation. Verse 31 Look at what Daniel says. He says, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. 
This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. Did you guys notice this? The stone, not from earth, cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became what? A great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream now, and we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Stop right there. Stop right there. So what, what happens? What does Daniel tell the king? He says there was a statue, which you saw in your dream. And can you, can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar's hair start to stand up at that time, right? Somebody's telling you your dream. You didn't tell anybody. And now this dude is telling you what you saw. And Nebuchadnezzar, I see his hair standing up. He says... There is this statue represented with a head of gold all the way down to feet of iron and clay. Descending values of metal happening here, right? Then out of nowhere, what you saw in your dream, this is probably the part that really freaked them out. There was this rock, not from earth, not cut with human hands, and it came and it struck not the head or the torso. Where did it strike? It struck the feet of iron and clay. Destroy the whole statue. And then out of that came a mountain. Wow. Continue reading. Verse 36. It says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whatever the children of men dwell... And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Look at, wow, verse 39. But after you are this head of gold, or but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Who is that? The, the Medes and the Persians, right? Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over you. Who conquered the Medes and the Persians? The Greeks. Alexander the Great. All prophesied in your Bible right before you. It's here in this book, verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. And then the Greeks? Romans. Romans, right? Verse 41, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Let's stop right there in verse 41. The Bible says that the Babylonian Empire, this was prophesied, would go into Judah... This happened in Daniel's day, that they would eventually conquer Judah. The Assyrians, we saw this, would make it all the way up to Jerusalem's gates and be stopped. We know from other books in the Bible, that's because God sent a distraction. That's because God sent an angel and they destroyed him and wiped him out. Crazy stuff, but I'm not going to get into that. But this already happened in Daniel's day. What Isaiah prophesied, happened already in Daniel's day. And they took Judah captive. They took the people. Why is Daniel in Babylon at this time? Because he was taken in the, as, as a captive. In all of his glory, Nebuchadnezzar's rule and reign on the earth, Babylon, the Bible says, was going to be invaded without firing a single shot. It was going to be conquered. Because I'm not actually, this is rhetorical, but do you remember what happened? Again, rhetorical, rhetorical. Remember what happened? As Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, having a drunken party. 
Do you remember the story? He, he's having a drunken party. He's getting, you can say, uh, I was going to say wasted. I don't want to use, I already used that word. But <laughs> it, seriously, like they were trashed. They're, they're having this party and they take the religious artifacts from Jerusalem's temple. They had them in storage because they took them once they conquered. Took the religious cups and utensils and they started drinking with them. And they're getting drunk and they're getting whatever. Uh, and suddenly a, a, a hand appears. I don't know what it looked like. I picture it kind of like uh, Super Smash Brothers, that white glove oh hand. God. I seriously do. I don't know why. But, but it, no, no. That hand appears and it starts writing on the wall. Mini, mini, tackle you far sin. And can you just... I, I, in my mind, I always picture these scenes out. I don't know about you, but I see Balshazar, or Balthashazar, however his name is pronounced. He's drinking, and suddenly like, it just starts dripping down, right? <laughs> and he's just like, you know, just dropping all over his pants. And he's just like, he sees this hand. And he's like, somebody get me an interpretation. And Daniel's an old man at this point. He's an old man at this point. Somebody says, I know somebody who can interpret this. And they bring Daniel in once again. He's old. He's an old guy at this point. Isaiah, again, way gone at this point. And Daniel says, oh, I'll give you the interpretation of this. I'll let you know what this means right now. Because the king was all like, speaking of that, because the king was like, oh, I'll, I'll make you super powerful in the kingdom. I'll make you second in command and give you all this gold. And Daniel's like, it's not going to matter, man. You can keep it. I'm going to tell you what this means. It means you have been, what does it specifically mean? It means you have been weighed in the balances and found lacking. And at that specific point, while Daniel was interpreting that handwriting of the wall, while this was happening, the Medes and the Persians, while they're having their party, and by the way, the Medes and the Persians were outside. They were partying because they're like, these guys ain't never getting in. They were mocking them. The Medes and the Persians had diverted the Euphrates River, dried it up and diverted it. And at that time, they were literally sneaking into the gates where the water came through that was now dried up. They were coming in through the gates, the whole army, and coming into Babylon, that huge walled city. It was being conquered while Daniel was interpreting that. And while they were having a party, the army was coming in and taking it. They had no idea. And so they came in. As this, as this hand was going there. The Bible tells us that when Balthasar saw that message, and he should have been. I love what the old King Jimmy says. It says that his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. <laughs> can, I put that, can I put that in English? He, he peed himself. That's what, that's what happened. Again, he, he was freaked out. Yeah, the word of God can be freaky when not, when not obeyed, right? When it hits you. Here's the most powerful king in the world at this time, peeing his pants. Isn't that a picture? Shaking his knees together. And the Medo-Persian Empire takes dominance, takes power, and then it's taken captive by who? This is Daniel. This is before this has all happened. They get taken by the next part of the statue, right? Alexander the Great. Taken by the Grecian Empire. And at the death, did you see the statue? Then the Grecian Empire taken by who? Say it again out loud. Mm -hmm. The Romans. But, but it's two legs this time. Why is there two iron legs? Wait, I, it's rhetorical, babe. <laughs> <laughs> because when Alexander died, you remember? Because his last great battle was actually taking the city of Babylon from the Medes and the Persians. He died of pneumonia, getting drunk, and he, and he died. And, then, and it was basically given to two empires because it became so big. Right? The Romans. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting... Alexander died. Romans took it, then it was split into two kingdoms. There we go. Got my mind back. Spit it into what the, the eastern and the, the western government? The two legs. Your Bible said this. <laughs> I love, I love, by the way, do you guys know skeptics' arguments to this? Because this is really good stuff. 
of world, and you want to know what skeptics argument against that was? Literally, they say, it's, it's so, it's too accurate, Daniel couldn't have written it, it was written afterwards. That's, no, I'm serious, that's the argument of the skeptic. Guys, that is stupid. <laughs> to look at facts, to look at the, the truth, reality is, people don't follow God because of a lack of evidence. Do you guys understand that? They don't follow God because they don't want to do what he says and submit themselves to him. The evidence is all right here. Daniel, oh, I'm not, I'm not even going into Daniel chapter 9. <laughs> you read that one on your own. It's a whole other Bible study, and I've done that one. But it said this would happen. So the Romans divided into two governments, and then when it began to falter, the Bible tells us, Here's it. Not you. Pop quiz for the rest of you. Maybe not Rob either. Who, who conquered the Roman Empire? It's no, nobody did. This is important. Nobody conquered the Roman Empire. It just kind of collapsed. It, Johnny's right. It, itself, they kind of defeated themselves. They, they collapsed on their own. Now, this is important because what was the last part of the statute? Now, the Bible says... According to the Bible, Rome has never actually been conquered. Why? Because the last part of that statue is what? Iron and clay. The iron representing the Roman Empire. So according to your Bible, now we're looking at the future. This, okay, look at the track record of the Bible. This is what I've been building up to. You guys see the track record I built up? Right? About the two witnesses, about 1948, even about uh, Russia being in Syria right now, about all of this other kingdoms that God said would happen, how the Babylonian Empire would rise and fall. Do you guys see the track record? Now, and we look at those Christians who, who did replacement theology, and we look at them and they're like, you guys are dumb, you should just trust to God. Wait a minute. Here in 2019, there's still one part of the Bible that is yet to be... Uh, this specific passage, there's something that is yet to be fulfilled. Question, are we going to be like those dumb Christians who didn't trust God's word? Because it, it seemed pretty stupid at that time. Humanly speaking. Are we going to be them? Because the Bible says that in the last days, nobody conquered Rome. There's going to be these toes, part iron and part clay, and the Bible tells us that during the days of these ten toes, ruling and reigning on the earth, that a stone would be cut without human hands, hit the feet and destroy the entire image, and the stone takes the entire earth. If you guys don't know what that is, that's the millennial kingdom that we talked about. The thousand year reign of Christ. Not yet happened. Ten ruling empires on the earth. Has that happened? Is the earth being ruled by ten kings? Ten kingdoms? Ten empires? Ten politicians? No. That is the future. So follow me here. If all of these empires were conquered by someone, who conquered the Roman Empire? No one did. It simply lost its control, meaning that the Bible is... This is what it seems to be saying that this Roman Empire is going to have some sort of resurrection and it's going to be defeated by God himself, that the Roman Empire is going to be revived in some way. This is what some people believe. And from that, from Europe, probably, right? For some reason, America is nowhere mentioned. We already talked about why that could be. But from Europe is going to come that Antichrist, is going to come that false prophet that the Bible predicts from that part of the world. So many people believe that there's going to be a form of the revived Roman Empire in the last days. Europe with ten representatives, probably after the rapture and the world collapses, I don't know, but after the rapture, the world's going to be in chaos. There's going to be a lot of people missing. And the ten toes, if you keep reading the book of Daniel, and even in the book of Revelation, it will tell you that there are also ten horns, which are ten kings. You guys know that passage? In the book of Revelation, ten rulers that will rule the world, 
which is interesting because most of the economies in the world are failing right now. Most of the governments of the world have been failing for a while. It's kind of like you see a government, they kind of get their traction and then they fall over really quick. Who is the, somebody help me. Who is that politician? I'm looking at you because you probably know, maybe Rob. No. Who is that politician that said, what we want, I think he was a, maybe a council member in the UN, but he said, we want a leader. He said a singular leader. And whether he be God or the devil, we will follow him because we are looking for a leader. You guys remember? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, look at, uh, I'll put it up for you guys afterwards. But when you look at the world, the world, it's tired of all of these. The world is looking it's globalization. for globalization. I must save the word because Gabe said it already. The world is looking. They're, they're tired of all of these different countries. They want walls to come down and they want a one world thing. That's what people in the world want. It's usually one people group all over the world that are pushing against this. It's usually the Christians. <laughs> Interesting, right? These are amazing times that we live in. We have chip technology. You guys all read about the chip technology. You can put it in animals. You can put it in your children if you lose them. You can put it... No, serious. You can just, just stuff. You can just go and you can scan it. They're, they've always been researching stuff. They can have your whole bank account, your social security card. They can have all of this stuff. And you can have it there. You can FaceTime. Right now you can YouTube live. You can turn on Instagram and put up a live thing. You can... Right now, wherever you are in the world, you can do this. Things, when you look at the Bible, are shifting and things are changing. Things, listen to this, don't fall asleep on me. Things that have to happen during the end times are falling into place. Isn't that crazy and exciting stuff? It, you're only scared if you don't realize that God is in control. That's the only reason you're scared. The Bible says that prophecy isn't to scare you, but to encourage you, to let you know that your God is in control. Read, here's, here's some homework. Read Luke 21, Matthew 24, <laughs> and just go through, go through a couple chapters in the book of Daniel. Watch these prophecies happening. Isaiah is going to tell us about things that are way into the future. He's going to tell us things about Babylon that go way... Oh, oh, ending, we're getting close to the end here, but ending chapter 13 and 14, which we'll dive into next week because it's, it's going to be a doozy. He's going to tell us that Babylon isn't just a physical place. It's not just a historical kingdom. He's going to take us into a Babylonian spirit that is going to be revived in the last days and, in his, as, and is in fact alive today. According to Revelation 17 and 18, this Babylon of the future, the kingdom may have been destroyed but the Bible says that the spirit of Babylon has not gone anywhere. Do you guys know what I mean by the spirit of Babylon? The spirit of Babylon, all the way back in the book of Genesis. Do you guys know there's two most, two most named cities in the Bible? Do you know what they are? All throughout the Bible, there are two cities that are constantly named. Anybody know? One is Jerusalem, and the other one is Babylon. Babylon represents, from the beginning of the book of Genesis, you see the tower being built, represents everything that is against God. Where even you see Nimrod, the leader of the first Babel, a hunter against the Lord, or a hunter. In the Bible, when it says that, it means that he was a hunter of men's souls, competing against God. This Babylonian spirit is alive today. It is the core and it is the nucleus of all pagan worship. The Bible tells us that in the last days, 
that it's going to have, it's going to be this very platform on which the Antichrist and the false prophet will utilize and deceive the world. We need to, this is what we need to make sure right now. This is what I'm going to end with. We need to make sure that everything that we have our lives built upon is upon Jesus Christ. Me and Gabe were talking, actually, when I was talking about this with a couple of you guys. We need to know now more than ever what it means to be a Christian. What it means to believe in the Bible and what it means to follow Jesus. Because this, the Bible says in, in Timothy, Paul warning the church, in the last days, there are going to be doctrines of demons that are going to deceive the church. So I want to end with this, an exhortation for you Christians to know your Bible and know why you believe what you believe. From worship all the way down to evangelism, to service, to your family life, to everything. You need to know your Bibles, Christians. You need to stop being lazy. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time and this crazy, crazy, crazy prophecy that we know is going to happen. And uh, God, it can be scary, but it's only scary if we don't trust in you. So we love you, God. And we ask for your favor in helping us to seek out the truth, to be lovers of the truth, to be lovers of you. God, to walk in purity, to not be deceived, to know that you are the God that I've heard so many times, the God who holds the future. Thank you so much for your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said. Amen.